Hi, everyone. Welcome to Geeks of the Roundtable. My name is Kelly Sosan Bearer, and I am the conference director at Buddhist Geeks. And today I am joined by Emily Horn, Nicole Fedley, and Sophia Diaz, uh, three great, deep, deep practitioners and also kick ass, amazing women. So I'm super stoked to be having this dialogue today with the three of you. Um, but before we go any further, I'd just like everyone to kind of ring themselves into this space by introducing themselves. Hi everyone, I'm Emily Horn and um, I am the retreat director at Buddhist Geeks and I have been practicing um, in the contemplative tradition of Buddhism for you know about 12 years now and mainly in the Vipassana mindfulness um, practices and I have also really um, been involved in a lot of dance throughout my whole life so I really consider that part of the practice as well. Hey everyone, I'm Nicole Fegley, and um, I guess for our purposes today, I consider myself a Buddhist geekette, and um, so um, I study uh, currently Mahamudra and Zogchen with Dr. Daniel Brown, and um, I'm also a longtime uh, you know scholar practitioner in integral theory and practice, um, aware that probably some people listening in might not know what that is, but that would take like six other calls. So <laughs> leave it at that and um, say one of the most um, true to my heart right now and one of the most recent things that I'm doing is, is exploring um, you know, integral feminine practice uh, through the vehicle of Integral Chicks, um, which I co-founded with Kelly, who's actually on the call here today too. So that's one of, one of many integral projects I've been involved with along with producing numerous seminars and events um, over the years. And finally, like I'm just super honored um, to be talking about this subject with um, the person that I study with, uh, Sophia Diaz. Um, so I study yoga and feminine embodiment with her and feel um, you know, honored and, and humbled <laughs> to be on the call with her and with these other two beautiful women, Kelly and Emily. So thank you so much for the invitation. Woohoo! Is it my turn? Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, uh, first, I just from what riffing off of what Nicole said, all embodiment is feminine, man or woman. Um, and love to dive deeper into a radically philosophical conversation about that. So <laughs> <laughs> it's just that uh, just the characteristics of a woman's nervous system lend themselves utterly and completely to women being geniuses of embodiment and of course there's an evolutionary thing about that which is we uh, are designed to give life for real so um, I we teach best what we most need to learn I uh, you know just in my given uh, karmas and I would say contracted karmas of embodiment I'm way too squeamish and way too skinny and luckily fell into the hands of very kick-ass teachers so since the early 80s I've had very deep and regular meditation practice but there's no way I would have been able to sit without recognizing as I was preparing for medical school that I wanted to heal before pe something that was up for people before they had to go to a doctor. So I apprenticed myself to the South Indian temple arts, which is actually, I think, the world's mm -hmm. greatest genius besides the chi arts, the martial arts, the most oldest intact genius about um, embodiment, which I think all of us will admit that we're somewhere on our way toward it. and. Um, confuse meditation with getting out of it. So, <laughs> Word. That, 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 that being said, long time my teachers asked me to teach way before I ever wanted I wanted to or thought I'd be ready. But we live in urgent times, and we teach best what we most need to learn. So the word embodiment just rocks my cockles to the core. 
<laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. And I would add that Sophia is actually um, a Hatha Yoga master and what what I would call an embodiment expert and consultant. Oh, definitely. I forgot to mention that little part. Yeah, because that, um, <laughs> that little part. And once again, not self-designated. It's to, you know my teachers that actually said, "Yeah, you you did it. You took this a little farther than I did." So cool. <laughs> a lot of yoga, way before anybody knew what it was <laughs> in this part of the world. Nice. Thank you. Yeah, so as we all know, the topic for today is embodiment, and I thought just an easy, cool, fun way to kind of kick off the conversation is for all of us to share um, what embodiment means to us. Um, I'm happy to start. <laughs> um, I'm happy to start. I've been thinking about this for the last few days, um, knowing that we had this conversation coming up. Um, and... I mean, embodiment is a really nebulous word to me in, in a certain in a certain way. Um, but I think the most simplest definition I can give of embodiment is I can boil it down to one word for me, which is aliveness. And really, how this shows up for me in my practice um, is is through koan study. Um, and in koan study, when it's time to present the koan to the teacher, you need to use alive words to demonstrate your understanding or your realization. And I've also translated that to mean that you need to give an embodied response to the koan. So really embodiment for me means um, like a full aliveness. Mm. I can go. Um, so I've been thinking about embodiment. Um, it's been a theme of my practice for several years now. I um, started off in a very masculine tradition and Vipassana and sat for many, many, many hours on a cushion. And um, along with that, I did, you know, bring in like hiking and movement and dance and things like that to actually bring me into my body in a way <clears throat> that I wasn't used to before. Um, meaning that I think a lot of what my process has been through and what I see in other people is that there's an energy field that we're outside, we're out here, and to bring our force, our life force, like Kelly was saying, our aliveness down into our bodies and actually live from a grounded place mm. is, um, I think, is what practice really teaches us if we can move past um, and integrate the transcendent mindset that our um, wisdom traditions have been grounded in for so long. Um, and that is a, that's been a really big process for me. Um, one thing I do want to add too that I've noticed is that it's a lot. It's very easy to talk about embodiment. It's very hard to actually put it into practice, and um, you know, because the body holds memories and associations and beliefs and all kinds of like patterns. And so, when I really start to get in touch with my body, I really have to start to work on a whole another level with myself. Um, mm. And that has been challenging because it, you know, it's not about like, okay, I got a six pack now or I got really big like muscles. It's like, okay, well, there's all these beliefs and, you know, feelings and associations that I have um, that I have to pull apart too so that I actually can feel comfortable and centered um, and here. So that's what I would say about embodiment right now. Mm. Nice. Awesome. Yeah, I can jump into and, and just say just – to echo what Kelly said, um, you know, in reflecting on this, um, embodiment to me too is, is somewhat of a, a nebulous concept. Um, you know, and I've kind of heard it referred to as, you know, having to do with the body related to the body, um, you know, real simply kind of walking the talk is another kind of ism that's thrown out there. But when I sat with it and just felt in <clears throat> to like what it is for me, it feels to me like a, like a wholehearted expression of an inseparability of kind of beingness and knowingness. Um, that's kind of a lofty way of saying just like an integrated expression of, of body, heart, and mind. Um, and I could di diverge here, but I just want to underscore that it includes for me body, heart, and mind. Um, a full engaged practice. Um, 
and I'm working that, you know, in everyday life. Um, it's one thing to think about embodiment or try to define it, but it's one thing to just, you know, sit on the cushion or get on the mat, um, you know, or be in the world um, in a way where I'm recognizing how I'm showing up and kind of dropping more fully into um, the expression of who I am and, and who I most want to be. Um, and, you know, I can't, I wish I could, but I can't really point out, um, you know, or articulate. It's like, okay, how do we get there? Um, you know, it's not simple and it's, it's messy and it's, um, it's beautiful when it's a felt expression, either, you know, in my body or from someone else. It's, um, it's a really beautiful thing to, to witness. So, um, that's kind of what's coming up for me um, in the moment and, and how I work with it. Beautiful. <laughs> My turn? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, riffing off of what Nicole said, um, embodiment is a direct perception of realization, of our realization unobstructedly 360 degrees every single cell on our body an actual eye of perception is what we are as human beings and we or we wouldn't be having this conversation so I'm gonna go against what Nicole said it actually is not complicated it's very very simple but we've inherited culturally a time and a place that has profound resistance and has developed disembodied technologies that we now identify more with than the perceptual mechanisms that those came from, which means we leave out the world. So our earth is suffering and everything else that is happening. But um, the main thing that I want to point out about embodiment is that, holy cow, and I would use the, you know, SH word, is <laughs> holy cow. Um, <laughs> Human beings are a particular shape, and it's not random. There is a cosmic reason for that. We're, we don't end, you know, we, we literally are light itself e equals mc squared. But I want to point out that in the survival function of being a human being's being, it is only the last hundred years that we have, ha have had the liberty of not moving in order to survive. 100 years ago, if you were as stagnant in your embodiment as any one of us really is, you know, even royalty had to put fire in a fireplace, heavy lifting for the princesses, you know, mm. in order to not die in the winter. So we're talking like the highest levels of society who had the most comfort still had to move their ASSESs, you know had to move and so right now we have a bit of a backwardness in our perceptual capacity mm -hmm. so uh, realization is a whole body capacity I don't think anybody would argue that but mm -hmm. since we are always listening to the masculine argument about reality it's always from the shoulders up and um, <clears throat> You know, it kind of cracks me up, and I also have to bow because of the ecstatic beauty of, like, Asanga's Bodhisattva Bhumi, a main tenet of Buddhism, you know. Bodhisattva Bhumi is the being of Bodhisattvaness, and the dissection in this is like, you know, atomical parts of what it is to live the Mahayana realization, which is extend beyond your step yourself. And the biggest argument is like being, non-being. Knowing the difference between being and non-being. And as a concept, we think we know that. But as a felt reality, it's a submission to the fact that we are actually a gesture and we have a choice of that gesture being conscious or not. And then it plugs into what Emily brought up is that the unconscious gestures in our being are reactions to the sensations of our past. Mm -hmm. And reactions are exactly the biggest obstruction to realization. Mm -hmm. So the fundamental 
thing that I would that, that I would say is first and foremost, it is very simple, highly resisted in our modern time, a very strange anomaly that is ruining our world, and I would also say the understanding, the whole body understanding of Dharma, and you can get there through actually reading the text, but realizing that these people had like snakes biting their ankles for real and had to like move their bodies and confront sensation every instant of their day in order to survive. We have immunized ourselves from sensation. Mm. We're a little bit lost and a little bit brutal about our existence because mm -hmm. of that. So mm -hmm. starting you know, from back from the main point of what embodiment is, I do not consider it an optional topic. I think not that we are <laughs> suffering our blindness to how backward we are in this and that we are the most subtlety backward culture that has ever touched this planet because of it. You know, mm -hmm. we don't take into account the feeling dimension as much as is necessary to enact realization. Mm -hmm. And the main definition of embodiment that I would give is no resistance to sensation. Mm -hmm. But you never know what you're resisting mm -hmm. if you're always in a 72 degree controlled environment with your hunchback <laughs> left over from your grandfather's offenses and your your <laughs> ghoul limbs pulled in just so that you can tippity tap 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 on the computer. It's like, no. You have no freaking clue what sensations you are constantly resisting and therefore judging the dimensions of full expression around you. And I would say the biggest thing we judge is the sensations, the heart sensations of emotions. Mm -hmm. And it is BS that we will ever erase emotions and that realization looks like a human being devoid of emotions. It's like, no, we are bliss intensity and we each have a unique shape of that. And bliss intensity includes radical feeling and radical feeling is totally purified emotional love content of humanity. So, oh, there we go. <laughs> that's, that's great. You can tell I'm fired up about the <laughs> topic. And <laughs> yeah, I just want to. I just want to riff off of what you said a little bit, and then pose a question for everyone in the group. Like, okay, so uh, yeah, like we're totally in this culture. It's backwards. We're disembodied. We're getting more disembodied. So, what is the way no. out? I don't think we are getting more disembodied. I just think that the most lofty, actually accurate conversations are happening from the shoulder up mm -hmm. in the conceptual dimension, whereas it takes a confession of the awkwardness of embodiment in order to start a real conversation amidst what, what is usually scholarly Buddhism, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm just really curious, like, what really is the way out if you are if you're wanting to get more embodied, let's say, what, how do we cultivate embodiment? What are some practices that we can actually engage in to consciously try to bring um, embodiment more online for ourselves? Well, first, total tip of the hat, and to this I'm kind of moved to tears. It's, you know, you all right now is just bringing up this conversation. is mm -hmm. just so beautiful. And when, you know, you bring it up again in the context of, you know, mixed company, meaning men and women, and for us to like culturally define you know embodiment experts um, I think that's the first thing to notice is that it's hard to locate until you can freely culturally acknowledge embodiment experts and to me that's why Hollywood is probably as influential as politics is because stars have to radiate and I'm afraid that stars tend to be the most embodied people that we consensually recognize they have to radiate. They have to be together. They have to have open channels in their body constantly. And then, you know, you go toward the radical embodiment masters. We have a great fear of the guru principle right now. And so we don't look to human bodies mm -hmm. anymore to demonstrate realization. We look toward the struggle. So I think that looking mm -hmm. toward, you know, tried, true, and usually we are more comfortable with dead people so, you know, on the feminine spectrum, <laughs> on the feminine spectrum, I would say Ananda Mayama is probably the most radical realization 
and a demonstration of embodiment because she actually glowed. Most people that are Westerners are her devotees because they literally were blinded by her light. Germans freaked out about what they were seeing and they had to investigate. So we know about Ananda Mayama mostly because of Germans, missionaries having their socks blown off by her. But Ananda Mayama, my, you know, my own teacher, highly, highly, uh, what do you call it, uh, you know, contradictory culturally character, Adi Da, oh my gosh, he, you know, <laughs> there is so much conversation about him because he was so freaking embodied and his body demonstrates it. So mm -hmm. I have, like, my favorite picture when I sat with him behind me, which I'll, I'll show you guys another time in more detail. But I think if we contemplate even, like, you know, the Buddha, when he was realized, was really skinny. He'd been sitting for a really long time. Mm -hmm. And in order to teach, he rounded out. You know, he had to conduct the force of his realization through his body and embrace yeah. humanity. And I'm telling you, you always get a little rounder. So realization and embodied realization really does have a physical look in human beings. And I, I think the first thing is to actually look around and see it because some of the most unprofessed practitioners are actually some of the most radically realized people. You know, mm -hmm. like mothers walking down the street, just round, compassionate, totally awake, ready for any feedback, um, noticing everything in the environment, you know, just 360 degrees of sensitivity and a tremendous amount of what I would call spinal wisdom, which is no fear of silence. Mm -hmm. So, mm. no fear of silence, that's a big one. Mm. Sorry. <laughs> I'm like, who is my that? favorite topic in the world? So, <laughs> yeah, I just I would say, um, I mean, it's hard to follow up anything uh, that Sophia offers and bow to her in, in thanks. But as I'm sitting here, my moment to moment experience, you know, am I breathing? Am I taking this in? Am I present? Yeah. You know, when I look at myself in this little window down here and I notice that I'm kind of, <laughs> you know, do I just allow myself to relax, you know, and continue to open and open? Um, and I, you know, for me, it's a very, it's a moment to moment thing and I'm not always on it. I'm more normally kind of in my thing, hunched over on the computer, doing what I got to get done, you know, but if we can just like relax and, and like feel, those little things where it's like I'm this is a resistance this is a resistance this is a resistance and let it go you know <laughs> and, and breathe and just be here you know that that was coming up for me when you know just witnessing Sophia so for whatever that's worth <laughs> let me give you one more thing to witness because I did dress for embodiment oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> nice. nice. Yes, they are magenta suede stilettos with ruffles. They, De oh my god, I thought I had those. <laughs> <laughs> those are a requirement. To Go out and buy a pair right now. <laughs> <laughs> Almost as necessary as a Zafu and Zabuton. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> or red lipstick. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it makes me think, I know, um, Sophia, you said it was simple, and mm. I really like that, and I like the ordinariness and the simpleness of it, because when we can drop into that being quality of, um, I guess, really being, like, the non-resistance of being alive, it does feel really simple, and yet there's so much of it that feels really complicated to me, mm. and... Um, you know, just for an example, like I was walk I was hiking Sunitas this morning and like the whole way up, all the sensations and I was like, This is killing me. This is gonna kill me. <laughs> and um, you know, I it was very them. easy for me to disassociate from my body, you know, and we fly up there in the like atmosphere and then it's like, wait, if I if I don't pay attention then I'm gonna pass out, you know, like I gotta come back, I gotta come back. <laughs> so to me, there is like there is a for me it helps to recognize that it is 
there is a um, like it just there is something that is difficult about it um, for me, and that that's been a, a process in itself of unwinding that struggle mm. because I feel like being alive and being in relationship with people, which I think a lot of times part of embodiment is relationship, and sometimes people don't want to actually be in relationship, so it's it's always um, something that I don't know people avoid, but and I avoid, and mm -hmm. so I guess what I'm saying is that even though that there it's simple, I I need to for myself acknowledge that it is it is a process, um, and I get and there's a paradox there for me, um, and I work with a lot of people that are they're geeks and they're software engineers and they're on their computers and they're all hunched over and you know and it's like <laughs> and it's been like five I mean I'm like okay so did you take a break and they're like well I gotta do this I gotta crank this out I got deadlines it's been five hours I'm like you haven't taken a break in five hours like <laughs> how can you even what is but if I tell them oh that's their job you know like how do you work with someone that that's their job that's their livelihood like I think eventually technology is going to become something that's like maybe Amber Case was talking about the conference last year that it's invisible and that we can, you know, the mm -hmm. best technology is invisible. And I really do hope for that maybe so it can become more integrated into our bodies. But I guess the question for me that comes up is like what are practices for people that that's their livelihood? You know, I'm not going to tell them that to stop doing their programming, you know. So how can we, how can we integrate the technology into embodiment? Mm -hmm. Well, the first technology that I think of in that particular case is both relational <laughs> and sensational, which is what I do because I definitely have been raised around the geekiest, most disembodied, who welcomed that as a growing edge in their evolution. Mm -hmm. So I would take my, my knuckles like this, and instead of talking to them, I'd press it into their erector spinae behind their heart and grab their shoulders and open it, and breathe a breath for them and all of a sudden they'd realize that their eyes were getting more circulation and they were better at what they were doing and they actually had more intuitive information available to answer the problem so not long after I ever offered just a tiny bit of like they're not gonna do it I can do it for them well to be sure by the time that I was I've always lived in community by the time that I you know was not living in community with these people you would never have known that they were unsegmented worms, you know, that <laughs> used to be that they themselves, yes, five <laughs> hours, 10 hours, 16 hours, that's a meditative capacity that to me I revere. I bow to that totally. But the opening of the shoulders <laughs> as they're attacking the next layer, the breath, the unfolding of the spine, the letting the kundalini actually nourish the cerebrospinal fluid in their brain and head mm -hmm. and they you know after a, a nerd or nerd dren spends 16 hours at a computer it's no wonder we have such a short attention span for um, or have this like desire for quick sex or something like that it's this release mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. in terms of letting a little bit more body energy flow I can guarantee you they all became better lovers because it's like turning to your lover to say, you know, I've been out of my body, but I've taken some self-responsibility, and now, you know, I welcome you helping me into it a little bit more. Mm. Now, that is a less abusive emotional sexual relationship <laughs> than what tends to happen yeah. in all of us disembodied people, you know, so mm. that that was that part but then the part that you said about how it feels complicated because of what comes up when you're basically conducting more energy through your body and you're an awake person to me it's where meditation comes in handy is you have to start witnessing the voice of your egoity mm. and the part of you that's saying I'm gonna die I'm gonna die I'm gonna die is your contracted egoity and the answer is of course you are <laughs> That is what you signed up for. Yeah. That part of you, any part of you that feels, that feels limited, but the simplicity comes when you actually add that meditative awareness to your own bodily reactions and the voice that comes up instead of feeling like that's your identity. And it mm -hmm. is your identity, your egoic identity, but you signed up to die. 
So then, <laughs> then the sensations actually, yeah. really the sensations actually become an ecstatic possibility because, you know, that the sensation of I'm going to die, I'm going to die, all of a sudden includes the possibility of being more open than you're used to running through this body. And in order to feel that, you feel what's greater than you and you actually relax at a heart level more than you did with the parental units you were born into. So that's why it feels complicated. It's huge in terms of the trust survival responses we have in our body, but easy relative to cultivating meditative witnessing capacity mm -hmm. about our own contraction. Mm -hmm. And you know you're contracted if anything you hear in your voice is limited. You mm -hmm. know, like, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. It's like, yes. <laughs> yes, you are. Right on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So the practices, actually, that you asked for, I'll just kind of summarize, is that we need, we need each other, and we don't need any more intimacy than just fundamental human care for each other's bodies as our own. Mm -hmm. to, it takes some respect, and you, you don't want to confuse somebody and you know, make them think that you're coming on to them or something. But I'm telling you, when you put your knuckles into their rector spine high behind their heart and open their shoulders and help them take a deep breath, I mean, the first thing that happens is that your eyes get more circulation, your vision gets better, it feels better. And so, you know, just the practice of noticing people's bodies in a way that you might just help them experience for embodiment. But the other thing is, is that you can do for other people in your own body this kind of magical participation. If you open a little bit more, breathe a little deeper, strangely enough, the room does, you know, mm -hmm. so that, and that, but tiny little movements and stretches and everything, I think the best practice for, you know, the nerd-like disposition of not moving or being a little more circulatory in the body is the noticing of how good it feels when you do a smidgen. Yeah. It feels really good, and then you yeah. follow what feels good instead of, I'm supposed to, and no, because the reason we don't feel more is because it hurts. It hurts mm -hmm. our heart. So yeah. Yeah, It hurts. <laughs> <laughs> Ow. <laughs> mm. Gorgeous. Well, I think we could sum it up by using Sophia's bomb-ass definition that embodiment equals no sensation, no resistance to sensation. Embodiment equals no resistance to sensation. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. But you have to put yourself in a disposition or position, which is why hatha yoga or dancing or anything, you actually have to defamiliarize yourself from your habitual movement in order to know your, your relationship to sensation. Mm -hmm. And so you can't mm -hmm. just hear that and go, oh, I'm there. You know, and if we have time, I have, like, my favorite story about that. <laughs> Do we? Sure. It's mm -hmm. so, I mean, I, I recall this over and over and over again, is that this, um, in Austin, Texas, I used to teach all the time, and um, there's some Sikh communities in the vicinity, really great communities with great teachers as their masters. And so a lot of the Sikh community, unbeknownst to me, you know, they just looked like women doing their thing were coming to these classes and getting a tremendous amount out of them. And so the teacher of the community noticed, and unbeknownst to me, he walked himself into my men's yoga class, you know. I, thank God, unbeknownst to me, because, you know, would have done. So, um, you know, I definitely adjusted him in a similar way in a downward-facing dog, as I just mentioned, you know, back of the heart, you know, stretching, whatever, in a downward-facing dog. And I did notice, you know, the quivering and warbling that comes up when you put your body in a position that conducts more energy than you're used to. And he came up to me afterwards, and he, and this is how I knew he was a master of something. It's like, i got to know who that man is. Now, first of all, he had no resistance to anything that I told him to do. He did it. My adjustments, he hung out. He listened to instruction to the very edge of his capacity. Magnificent, you know. At the end, he comes up to me, and he bows, and he said, 
I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity for being aware of the hatred I still held for my father in my hamstrings. Mm. Wow. wow. <laughs> and, and he walked away. Now, of course, afterwards, you know, in the whispering, giggling, it's like, did you know who that is? Da, 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 you know? And uh, totally, <laughs> totally in awe of what a real teacher is. That is a real teacher, not sitting on the sidelines criticizing your students and not diving in and also not acknowledging that they grew from something that isn't you. <laughs> and, you know, and also, I'm sorry, not just letting your hair down, but being totally naked in something like a yoga class where you're at your very edge every second, you know? Mm -hmm. It's like total face losing awkwardness. And that's me I'm every just class. I know it's like <laughs> yeah, that's my daily my yoga experience. <laughs> so that's what I mean. No <laughs> resistance to sensation. Now that's a very awake, realized being discovering something he held that he could never hold discover without placing his body in a position that was outside of his familiarity. Mm -hmm. And so that's the yoga systems, the chi systems, African dance, you know, everything does it to us, but we have to find the practice that we're attracted enough to, to use as a real meditative, contemplative movement practice. Because you take your meditative awareness into your total dorko, newborn moose awkwardness, and then... You find out what embodiment is. <laughs> mm. Cool. Hmm. I feel like we're at a, a nice embodied stopping point. <laughs> I feel embodied. I feel more yeah. embodied than when we started. <laughs> no, it's, it's interesting, right? Yeah. <laughs> And all I did was like move my shoulders back and open my heart a few times when Sophia mentioned it. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, tip of that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you yeah, so much. much. Thank you all. Yeah, yeah so, this was an awesome conversation. Yeah. I feel like we just started, so I, I look forward yeah. to many more, many more goddess <gasps> chats to all of you. <laughs> this, this instigated a really big like fire in the belly yearning to have a dance party with you guys. Like, Kelly, you DJ. I shall. <laughs> yeah. You ladies dance. <laughs> so I'm going to take us off the air right now, and I'm not sure what's going to happen to the Hangout, but I'm going to end the broadcast.